Good evening. I'm Larry Rinder. I'm the director of the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here this evening for uh, another fantastic late program, which will kick off with this uh, conversation that I'm about to have with uh, my uh, partner, colleague from down south, Jeffrey Deitch, director of Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. Um, So before we get into the conversation, I want to say a few words of thanks to the folks who put this evening together, uh, starting with Steve Side, who is organizing the late uh, series in conjunction with the Barry McGee exhibition, Sherry Goodman, Director of Education, who helped with this, and Sean Carson, of course, wave Sean, Sean does all the great stuff behind the scenes, thank you so much. Um, and as I said, uh, this particular series of late programs is uh, organized to coincide with and to really celebrate the Barry McGee exhibition. And so Barry himself, of course, deserves uh, you know, acknowledgement and gratitude and uh, expressions of wonder uh, for all the great work that he's done throughout his career and particularly for this show. Uh, so thank you, Barry. Uh, Dina Beard, Dina, raise your hand wherever you are. Oh my goodness. Are you still here? Anyway, there she is. She's not raising her hand, but she is here. Dina, uh, my co-curator on the show, who just did such a tremendous job. Couldn't have done it without you, Dina. Thank you. Um, our tremendous funders, uh, beginning with the Andy Warhol Foundation uh, for uh, the Arts, fantastic organization, and presenting sponsors, Citizens of Humanity, and major support from the National Endowment for the Arts. So thanks to all of our supporters, wherever they may be. Uh, Jeffrey Deitch uh, probably needs no introduction to this audience, uh, but I'll just say that, as repeat, that he is the director of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, uh, former director, owner of Deitch Projects in New York, and uh, I think it's fair to say a force within the art world today uh, and someone who I have looked to for uh, many decades of my own career for inspiration. Uh, but I do want to ask Jeffrey if you can comment on your own background in the arts and feel free to go back as far as you'd like to uh, the crib or however far back you'd like to go. When did it all begin for you? Well, thank you so much, Larry. Uh, first, I want to say it's, it's such a pleasure and an honor to be here and also to understand how Larry thinks, how he organizes things. I think you asked me one year ago to reserve this date. You know, so it's so interesting when you have an exhibition like this where Barry works on the border between order and chaos. There's a lot of order uh, behind what you see here, and uh, very much appreciate Larry and, uh, and the team here and the amazing organization. It's not easy to put on an exhibition like this. It's Barry challenges the walls of the institution. He challenges the structure and uh, pushes us. Uh, and we all have to move, and we're all very grateful for the way Barry pushes us. I want to say also that uh, Larry has long been an inspiration for me. Uh, my favorite of all the Whitney Biennials going back to the 70s is the one that Larry curated. And uh, I've sort of, I've spent the years after that mining it for ideas for projects, artists to work with. Uh, so it's a great, great pleasure to be here. I also want to say that uh, I've worked with hundreds of artists, some of the great artists, but I really don't have any hesitation in saying that of all the artists I've worked with, it's Barry who's my favorite. And it's, it's because it's not just working with the art, working with the ideas. It's Barry's humanity. It's the phenomenal circle of other artists, musicians, other creative people who he brings with him. So I'd say Barry changed my life. Uh, I think a lot of people who have followed Barry's work could say the same thing. And I would encourage you, who probably already have, to really immerse yourself in this exhibition. And uh, if you stay with Barry, he'll change your life, too. 
Great. So let's get back to your life for just a moment, if we may. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> All right. So, well, I've done everything in art, okay? So I've, um, and part of what I believe in and what I encourage other people to do is uh, don't put yourself in a box if you're a creative person. So I've been an artist, an art writer, um, an art dealer, an art collector, um, a curator. Uh, now I'm a sort of administer, administrator of a public institution. Um, I'm not sure what's left, but I'll, I'll figure something else out. Great. Um, so how, how did you go about starting Deitch Projects? Uh, that was the, the um, sort of the venue for your first engagement with Barry's work. And was it a typical gallery, or were, was it different from the model of a typical gallery, particularly at that time? No, Deitch Projects did not begin as a gallery. So that's the more public part of my career, but I've had a long career prior to that. Deitch Projects began in January 1996. I actually started in the art world in 1972. My first gallery was... It, was, it, it wasn't really even an art gallery, even though we showed art. It was called the Copper Artisan, and it was an outlet for this handmade copperware that we made in my father's sheet metal shop, and we needed something on the walls. So uh, we asked some local artists, hey, could we borrow some things? And to my astonishment and to the artist's astonishment, we sold these things on the wall. I asked for more. And the end of the summer, one of those artists sat me down and said, I see you, you have an aptitude for this, you like this, but you don't know what you're doing. You need an art education. And I listened to him. And I've been on my art education ever since. So basically, I was more in the business side of art. I was a private art dealer, advisor, did a lot of things. I started an art market department for a big international bank, for Citibank in 1979. And that, that was, uh, that's a whole, there's a whole story there. And then I took many of the customers I developed at Citibank, started my own art advisory business. But I was missing the creative outlet. And there was this special building on Grand Street in Soho that I always loved. I used to walk by it in the 70s when it was a carpenter's shop. And my friend Joe Fawbush uh, had died, and his partner knew that I loved this building. And he said to me, how would you like to take this building over? He was sort of desperate. He needed $50,000. and said, if you can give me $50,000 just to help me out, I'll turn over the lease to you, which was really inexpensive, like astonishingly inexpensive, like $4,500 a month. That's what Soho, that's, that's what it was like not so long ago, 1996. And uh, I said, yeah, why not? And so uh, it wasn't really as a business. It was a, a project gallery. And the idea was that I would invite artists who'd never had a solo show in New York City to do something that they always want to do. Because when I visit artists, often artists would have some unrealized dream. They would be making their smaller paintings, drawings, but there would be some big project. They said, I wish I could do this. And knowing that almost every good artist had this, I said, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to go to artists and say, I'm going to make your dreams come true. And within limits, of course. And so the limit was a budget of $25,000. And we'd do whatever you wanted. That was the money, $25,000. And the idea was, don't just do your regular show. Go beyond it. And people loved that idea and really went beyond it. And the concept was, if we sold it, great. If not, I would keep it and be the basis for a collection. But what happened is people began buying these artist dreams, and artists wanted to be involved, and it became both a business and then, to my great pleasure, the most important part, it became a community. And Barry McGee was a big, big part of its becoming more than just a gallery and became 
a kind of a clubhouse and a platform for all kinds of creative activity. So when did you first become aware of Barry's work, and was there a major shift in the character of Deitch projects before and after you showed his work? Yes. So I, was, I had the great pleasure to be very involved with the wild style graffiti artists in New York in the late 70s, early 80s. So I was very friendly with... Fab Five, Fred, Freddy, still am, Lee Canonis, Crash, Dondi, uh, Futura, uh, Dondi's passed away, but the other guys, they're, they're still very good friends of mine. And I did a lot with them. I brought Futura and others to Hong Kong and did all, many projects. <laughs> but what, what happened is that this wild style graffiti was so strong and influential it spread all over the world. It's like a phenomenon with pop art, where within a few years, wild-style graffiti was everywhere. But I think it was so strong, it tended to stifle additional innovation. People tended to copy the wild-style artists. And so, for years, I was waiting for some new talent to come out of street culture that showed a new path to achievement in street art and redefining graffiti. And I had to wait a long time. I waited uh, 15 plus years until I finally saw the work of Barry McGee. And uh, I actually became aware of Barry's work not on the street, uh, because he was in San Francisco and I was in New York. It was through the brilliant programming at the Drawing Center directed by Annie Philbin, who is now in Los Angeles at the Hammer. And they had a great program. They had a, an exhibition of wall painting. And I went in there and looked and I saw Barry's wall, and I was stunned. And Annie Philbin told me, oh, I know, you know you're going to want to show the work. You're going to want to get But forget it, OK? Barry doesn't want anything to do with the commercial art world. All these art dealers want to get involved. They sent him letters. He never answers the letters. You know, he doesn't pick up the phone. So don't even bother. But of course, that made me even more interested. And it happened that another artist who was introduced to me by Annie Philbin's program at the Drawing Center, Shazia Sikander, who's from Pakistan, was invited to be in a wall painting exhibition with Barry in St. Louis at the Contemporary Forum. And Shazia... You know, like a lot of artists, you know, doesn't stand on ceremony. What do you mean, you know, you, you can't, you know, he doesn't answer letters. Uh, just come down with me. We'll, we'll meet him. And I said, you sure that's okay? So she was working next to Barry in the next wall. And Barry said, yeah, yeah, let the, the guy can come down. So I flew down to St. Louis, and uh, Barry was in the middle of working. I introduced myself. Uh, Barry was very shy, as some of you know, but we slowly began talking. And then I began sharing some stories about our heroes from Wild Style and the names I mentioned, and that was very meaningful to Barry. And by the end of the day, Barry said, well, okay, well, we're doing the show. And his show was transformative. So uh, I knew something was happening when we began seeing kids sitting on the sidewalk with their skateboards like two days before the opening. And for the opening, they came in on Greyhound buses from the Midwest, from Canada. And I understood that there was something remarkable that was happening here, that Barry's work spoke to a generation. And it was something that I, I showed a lot of good artists who had good, good reviews, a good audience, but there was nothing like this. There was nothing like this of an artist whose work really connected and connected with people who didn't come necessarily out of an academic art training. So what was the reaction of the wild style folks? Um, was there any geographical rivalry? Uh, you know, people like, well, who is this San Francisco guy coming into oh, New York? Yeah, like, like between, you know, like Biggie Smalls and, you know, Tupac. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, no, no. <laughs> No. So, you know, there are, unfortunately, beefs in the graffiti world. But somehow Barry is beyond that. 
But so when I asked Barry, who would you like to come to the opening? Who, who, who should we get here? And he, he's very retired. He didn't really mention anything. He said, hey, you, should I get Futura to come and Lee? And he was so excited. You think those people would actually come to my opening? And I said, we'll get them. And so he was thrilled. They all came. And uh, you know, they're, they're all friends now. And so, yes, uh, that group totally embraces Barry, and Barry embraces them. And how about the rest of the New York art world? How, how did the, uh, the critical establishment and the collectors of New York City respond to Barry's shows? Well, you know, so this is a very big issue, okay? So, um, you know, we did a, a big history of graffiti and street art at the Museum of Contemporary Art, and in terms of attendance, it was the most popular exhibition in the history of the museum. But a lot of the art establishment refused to accept that this was part of the art dialogue. And this has been my mission for a long time. This has been my mission since the early 80s when I was a big advocate of the Wild Artists and then of Basquiat and Keith Haring. You know, at the beginning, Basquiat and Haring weren't accepted. Like, there's a famous limerick thing by, uh, no, it's, it's a sonnet by the late Robert Hughes who characterized uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat and Keith Haring in the most derogatory terms that they weren't really artists. They were like mascots. And um, unfortunately, uh, there was a quote that I don't know if it's real that was widely repeated in Los Angeles during Art in the Streets know, uh, that the sort of the most esteemed person in the LA art world, John Baldessari, supposedly said, street art belongs in the street, you know, not in the museum. And so I've been on this mission, say, for a long time, to say art that comes out of street culture is not second-class art. It's not some subspecies. The best art that comes out of the street is art. And it's good to have a mission. And uh, I'm still on, this is uh, 25 plus years later, still sort of fighting the cause. Uh, I'll just give, give you an example. Uh, so we had a great show, Barry McGee. Uh, some of the work from that show is here, the famous bathroom piece. So I offered to donate that bathroom piece, plus all these other works, to the Museum of Modern Art. And they turned it down. They didn't even want it for free. So, uh, you know, it's, we, we have still a ways to go to convince the art establishment that this is important art mm -hmm. that is part of the mainstream of contemporary visual culture. So one of the things that I think confuses a lot of people is when you use the terminology, not you personally, but when one uses terminology like street art, they imagine that one is talking about a kind of a parallel universe that is separate from uh, you know, art history and has nothing to do with art history and has its own criteria and its own, you know, lineages and, and whatnot. But I think it's, you know, Barry, for one, of course, studied art uh, formally at the San Francisco Art Institute, and you, in your essay for the catalog, have pointed to some specific resonances in his work with artists from Carl Andre to Andy Warhol. So can you talk a little bit about how, in Barry's work in particular, if you want to talk about street art in general, there are uh, resonances sure. with mainstream art history? Sure. Well, I've always been fascinated by how a lot of the most innovative new material art, new vocabulary, comes out of subcultures. So let's look at... Okay, so the band Picasso with uh, the group coming out of these uh, sort of underground cafes in Barcelona and this bohemian world and Montmartre. Uh, you know, this, this is really... A, the, Picasso, as you know, had great academic training. His father was an art professor. But he mixes that with this bohemian subculture. And otherwise, he might have just become an academic if he was never immersed in that subculture. So you know, if we watch and see where 
artistic innovation comes from, a lot of it comes from these, what I call subcultures, graffiti subculture, skateboard subculture, uh, music, punk rock subculture. Uh, but Barry, in addition to all that, uh, being very, very much a part of that in a real way, uh, you know, had an excellent education at the San Francisco Art Institute, uh, had a fellowship where he went to Brazil, studied folk art and all, whatever else he could take in. But Barry is a very astute observer of, of, of contemporary art and contemporary art history. And so if you look around, you will see a grid structure that relates to Carl Andre, uh, a use of m materials that relates to Arte Pover artists like Kunelis, uh, and the, you know, the, the modular structure that connects to the way Warhol would construct a composition with all the pictures of Marilyn or other celebrities, and uses of text and uh, numerals that connect with so many artists, of Joseph Kasuth, Ed Roche. Uh, Barry is very, very aware of all this, uh, a lot of connections, the installations with Ed Keenholz. So you, you can spend a lot of time, we could go through this whole show and talk about all these art historical precedents. Uh, but one thing I love about Barry is there is an equivalence between the most esteemed artists, let's say like somebody like a, a Carl Andre, and then like behind us, there's certainly uh, a dialogue with geometric tradition, with op art, uh, but also with uh, the floors of old buildings in Rome, uh, with all the, the, kind of the, the tile work that you might see. So uh, with these accumulations of drawing, frame drawings, uh, that's something that connects with, let's say, Alan McCollum, who is well known in the so-called neo-geo movement, but Barry also was influenced by uh, images, relics of saints and images in churches in Brazil. So he's someone who can mix all of these sources with this kind of equivalence where something from street culture, something from religious folk art, and something from you know, the tradition of Mondrian and uh, concrete artists is treated with equal respect. So speaking of uh, synthesis and hybridity, one of the things that is really uh, not unique about Barry's work, but certainly distinctive, is the role of collaboration. And I wonder if you could talk about your, your observations about the role of collaboration in his work. Sure. Well, I'll tell you a little story. So our first exhibition with Barry, um, Barry uh, says, uh, do you mind if I bring an assistant with me from San Francisco? Oh, of course. Of course you can bring an assistant. So uh, Josh Lascano comes with him. Um, a lot of you know Josh. You recognize him. He's always the figure on the top. <laughs> that's, that's Josh, also a maze. So um, you know, Barry's working there by himself, and I say, hey, Barry, where's your assistant? Isn't he going to help? And uh, Barry says, well, um, yeah, he's, he's getting the word out. I didn't quite understand what he meant until the next day, walking all around the neighborhood. On every mailbox, there's twist stickers and twist uh, tags. And then the day before the opening, a gigantic, ugly, amazed roller tag on the facade of the building next door that uh, remained there for 10 years or so until the building finally collapsed. But, you know, it, it was... Sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah. No, no, one, no one could miss it. Right, right. So, so Barry, the first day he comes in, allocated two weeks for him to do the installation. First day he comes in about one in the afternoon and uh, putters around uh, for, until six, seven when the gallery staff leaves. Uh, nothing's really happening. He's just kind of moving around, looking at things in boxes. 
Uh, then we come back the next day, and there's terrific stuff that he's done at night. Then second day, uh, Barry arrives right around 6 when, just as we're leaving, and puttering around for a little while, and then again works the night. By the third day, the gallery staff leaves. Gallery, gallery, Barry has not even shown up. Okay, so you know it's he it doesn't even come in during the day. Then the next morning we come in and amazing things have happened. He's covered a half the wall with amazing works. Some fragments of it are here, and but the most intriguing thing there are like. 30 pizza boxes and maybe like 50 beer bottles and you know all you know uh, kind of trays with all kinds of ashes and butts and you know I wonder wh who's been there this is unbelievable and um, then by like the sixth day or so people began to say oh I was in your gallery last night with Barry and so what I realized is that Barry uh, he just he didn't want to mix it with our business, but every night while he was working, there were 30, 40 people there. It was the whole scene of his, all the, the people from the skateboard scenes, other graffiti writers, musicians. People were actually playing instruments there, and uh, so it was an amazing thing going on. I've actually, you know, uh, at a certain point witnessed the whole thing. It was, you know, but at a certain point, Barry was comfortable enough with me, so I could actually hang around myself with all this. Uh, but this collaborative spirit is really important. And so a work like this, Barry cannot physically do by himself. So he has a whole team of people working uh, with masking tape, doing everything you need to make these geometric shapes. Um, uh, his brother, Mike, who's here, is a crucial part of the team. And Mike works with Barry on all the motors of these tagger figures. And there are a whole group of other people um, and who are, there's a, a long-time collaborator. We mentioned Josh. Uh, there's a team that makes the animatronic. Kevin things. Ansel. Yeah, Kevin Ansel is very important. Uh, so when, when you invite Barry to do a show, all these people come with him. And he is very open with them in allowing them to do their thing within Barry's aesthetic. So uh, Kevin is doing his own work, but it's also Barry's work. And it reminds me a lot of the Andy Warhol factory, where Andy would have his superstars and his crew, and they did their own thing, but they, they had completely absorbed Andy Warhol's aesthetic, and they were extensions of Andy in the work. And it allowed Andy to do so much more than he could do on his own. And Barry, in his very low-key way, has the same thing going. So there's no way you could do a show this ambitious with just Barry. He, he needs his team, and they keep going with him and make it happen. All right. So uh, those of you who came in the front doors would have seen the wonderful Amaze tag that covers the front doors, which Josh, and Bar with Barry's help, did. Uh, Amaze is Josh's tag. But you will have noticed that on top of that, there are some additional tags, including one that says sell out, which does not refer to the catalog, un unfortunately, although we're close. Um, but I wonder, Jeffrey, if you could talk a little bit about the tension with Barry uh, around the issue of, issue of commercialization uh, there's so much to the street cred, if you will, of his work that has to do with resisting commercialization um, and the establishment. Uh, but as he becomes more and more successful, that inevitably does become a factor in the life of his work, if not in the life of Barry himself. Well, yeah, there, there's this um, I think illogical kind of uh, complaint that's put on to artists who come out of the street culture that, you know, that you, 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 you shouldn't show with a gallery, uh, your work should be stolen, it shouldn't be sold, um, and, you know, you should stay on the streets to preserve your street cred. But I don't agree that, you, that anyone has the right to say to an artist, you cannot participate 
in the dialogue of contemporary art history. So almost every artist, whether they start in the academy or whether they start on the street, they want to be part, if they're ambitious, they want to be part of art history. They want to be part of this big dialogue. You know, they don't want their work to be measured ultimately against an, some other taggers. Uh, an, an artist with the talent and ambition of Barry McGee wants to ultimately be part of the dialogue uh, with Andy Warhol and others, met Carl Andre, Jeff Koons, um, and he wants to be in this dialogue, in this place. So there's a giant difference between commercialization and wanting to participate in the serious dialogue of art, wanting to show your work in a gallery that's inside that system, to show in a museum. So that's where artists want to be. And uh, there, I think it's a big misunderstanding of that an artist can certainly keep their personal integrity, their social beliefs, all of this, and present their work in a serious way to be considered as part of the art historical dialogue in a museum. It's not selling out at all. That's following the artist's dream. So uh, a question, we, we sort of uh, had a chuckle about this earlier that many people would like to ask but perhaps are too shy to ask is, w what is it about? What, it, what is Barry's art actually about? <laughs> right. So, so uh, Larry sent me a short list of questions, including the questions, what is Barry's art about? And it's, it's funny because inside the Art Academy, you never ask that question. You know, you know, kind of go around it. But all my years as an art dealer, like standing at an art fair, you know, just anybody can come in. They look at a Barry's work and say, "Tell me, what's this about?" Okay, so what is Barry's work about? Well, first, there's something very important to understand about Barry: that it is an entire artistic world. So Barry doesn't just paint a picture. It's it's a whole aesthetic world that he invites us into. It's a whole vocabulary. It's, it's a vision. And we can immerse ourselves in it. We, we, we can really feel it. And it's the social connections, the music, all these, all these other aspects are part of Barry's world. Uh, then there's another essential thing about Barry's work. And this is about how connects to people, it speaks to people. Barry's work is infused with humanity. And so you look at the images of the sad old man on the bottles and those figures on the big red panels. There's an amazing sympathy for the people who've been left behind by society. And so some people just walk down the street and they see you know, the winos passed out with a bottle of Thunderbird next to them. Um, Barry stops to look at them, to photograph them, to think about them, and to paint them. And so to have images like that here in the museum, uh, he asks us who are in this privileged world here sometimes, to remember these people who are there lying on the sidewalk. Uh, but it's not just that kind of humanity. It's uh, a, a wonderful absorption into people's lives, humor. Look, look at, the, at the Ray Fong shop over here. So this is, this is an amazing installation. And Barry's taken this tradition that goes back to someone like Ed Keenholz, and, but he's taken it into a whole new level. And he's created a character here. So Barry is, in a way, a kind of novelist as well, that you can look in, you can see the person who has this crazy shop selling you know, the obsolete VHS tapes and... Uh, hanging out in the back on his bed, you know, doing something nasty. And, uh, and then you see the Josh character tagging in the bath bathroom. 
so there, there is a whole narrative about people um, that we can all relate to. Uh, Barry has an, a, a wonderful sense of humor. And um, you know, some people don't always get it. You know, there's that sign there of, of Ray Fong with the buck teeth. Uh, when Barry uh, used that image on some athletic shoes, people went crazy, said, you know, it's discrimination against Chinese Americans. But that's actually the caricature of Barry as a young kid himself. And he, he can look at himself with that kind of humor. So uh, what I think Barry is able to do is he's able to take his unique experience of life growing up in San Francisco, uh, growing up in an ethnically mixed family, uh, uh, unlike a lot of people who are in the art world, it's more of a kind of a working class background. Uh, his father had an auto body shop, and he was very involved and very involved in car culture as a kid. And so he's taken this whole world and taken his life experience and connected that with his knowledge of art history, his exploration of folk art, his interest in old signs that he sees, these declining uh, manual arts, and he's mixed it all together to create a remarkable artistic worldview that we can enter into. Yeah. So one of the virtues of a, uh, a retrospective or a mid-career survey like this is that you get to see a trajectory of an artist's career. Is there any, have you had any revelations or do you notice anything in particular as you look here at work Barry did from the late 80s to the, to the present? Uh, the level of complexity you know, it keeps being pushed and pushed. Uh, something we certainly notice here is Barry's increasing interest in abstraction. And so I was talking with Barry some years ago about graffiti and about you know, what did he really like. And we talked about the graffiti with cartoon characters and <laughs> the big, um, big machines with... Um, interlocking signature piece um, that artists would do like 40 feet on a wall. And Barry said what really began to interest him was the smaller abstract tags, the, the really the ugliest ones, the ones done with big dripping, big tip magic markers. Because um, he loved the abstraction of those. And I could see he was getting increasingly interested in the abstract quality. Uh, what really surprised us is when he began coming up with what he calls the geometrics. And uh, that was really a breakthrough that opened his work into a new place. And he was able to take what he did into the geometrics and to bring it back into the accumulations. Um, and he keeps on pushing each one of these forms. So I love this accumulation with what he refers to as the bump. So well, the accumulations used to be flat and take up just a portion of the wall. Then they began taking up the whole wall. And then he added this bump element to make it more sculptural. It's also kind of humorous. It's like a pregnant body. Of, but it's, it's, also, it's, it's something that makes you smile. Um, I am fascinated with the latest uh, innovation in Barry's work. And that's, uh, well, it's the one with the numerals. You can see it back here with a 99-cent store. And it's sort of Barry's take on kind of new digital-type imagery. It's like he's, it's a kind of a, his folk art approach to being inside a computer. Or, you know, uh, maybe it's not really a computer. It's like an adding machine. Um, but it, it's, I, I think this work up here is absolutely stunning. And it's a breakthrough in understanding how to apply another kind of vernacular imagery and abstract it. And uh, so it's something that comes both from studying painting and serial imagery. Maybe a, an artist like Roman Opalka who just 
goes through with numerals. And it's also just thinking about the humor of the 99 cent store. It comes both from a vernacular and from a very sophisticated place. So you, as you mentioned, have been a big champion of street art for many years against the tide of uh, sort of the greater wisdom of the art world. And I want to ask, are there other um, sort of subcultures that you're following now or sort of cultural uh, you know, areas that the art world is not paying attention to that you think really do deserve a second look? Well, okay, so I think some of you have followed. There's a bit of controversy that's uh, trailing me in Los Angeles. So people really went crazy when it was leaked that I was planning a, an exhibition about the history of disco. They, people went crazy. That, that led John Baldessari to finally just resign from the MOCA board. Uh, but, see, I'm, I'm fascinated by and how subcultures produce cultural innovation. And I'm very interested in phenomena like punk rock, like disco, that are these vast cultural movements that encompass the visual arts, fashion, of course, music, dance, and also have this important social impact. So I've become very interested in um, the new electronic dance music. Some of it, you know, you know is really like Muzak. It's, it's awful. You know, some of these big names, like who get $250,000 a night, it's a kind of like it's a high-tech Muzak. But um, there are others that say DJ Harvey does this. You know, some of the godfathers of this, Daft Punk, who are just total geniuses. And so I've been so interested in this. And I've immersed myself in this, this group. And a lot of the people like Daft Punk, they also do visual art. And there, so there's a whole group of artists, musicians, dancers, filmmakers, who are into this group around electronic dance music. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to do the disco show, because disco is the historical foundation of this. So is, is the disco show happening? Are you curating the disco show? Yes. Uh, well, it's whether we can actually pull it off in Los Angeles or not, I'm not sure. But two things happened. Uh, w there was a story in the New York Times about James Murphy. Some of you might know James Murphy. He's one of the great musicians of our time. He was the person behind LCD Sound System. And he just abruptly, at the height of LCD Sound System, decided to shut it down and pursue new projects. And so immediately I said to James, I've got a project for you. How would you like to be my co-curator of a show on the history of disco and its impact. And he said, I'm on. I mean, you know, he's, you know, so we're doing it. So in a profile on him in the New York Times, he said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I've just been in LA talking with Jeffrey Deitch about curating a disco show. And so it, all this negative stuff happened on one side, but on the other, it's unbelievable. But maybe a hundred plus notes, calls, emails from people said, I want to be in, I want to be part of this. And, amazing stuff coming out of the woodwork. Like, like every innovator in this, a person who's part of the history of disco, wants to be part of the show. So Vince Aletti, who's a great writer on photography, who wrote the disco files, he's now the curator of photography for the show. So it's going to be an amazing project. And um, we already have a European venue. and. Uh, I'm going to enjoy working on this for the next right. few years. I'm seeing a big disco ball. I really am. Okay, well, let's, right let's bring it here. All right, so I, I have um, a sort of another question that's uh, sort of an equivalent to the what's it all about question, which is, what is the purpose of a museum today? Oh, that's, see, that's a great, another great question, a giant question. So, well, one thing I'd say is that... that for a contemporary art museum, we've been privileged to have experienced an absolutely amazing time in the history of art. So I, I think that art in America from the 
late 1940s. Um, it's a little, we're too close to the present, but certainly through the end of the 60s. It's like the Renaissance in Italy, or, you know, it, it's maybe even beyond that, because um, it's, it's spilled out into shaping contemporary culture as well. And hard to know, is it still as dynamic right now as it was in 1968? Uh, I hope it is. I'm part of it. I don't know, but we have an amazing opportunity and mandate in the Contemporary Art Museum to articulate, to write this history. So that's one of my motivations. And so that's one of the important roles of the Contemporary Art Museum. We've just been to make concrete and to interpret what we've witnessed. Now, then there's the whole social side of this. Okay, so uh, the visual arts are changing a lot because visual language, images, uh, is becoming something that people are more comfortable with than written language. And so a younger generation is remarkably fluent in visual images and understands visual images in a different level, and it's an international language. And, but like I do, maybe some of you do, say there's a gallery show someplace in Los Angeles, it, it, it can take an hour and a half to drive just to one gallery. Well, I won't bother driving. I'll look it up on the internet. Everyone has a website and stuff, so I just see it digitally. But I've noticed in Los Angeles where you have this problem, where you have also you know, everybody's people fluent in using the internet. The museum, say, in the middle of the week, Thursday afternoon, there's almost nobody there in the museum. It's really sad. But we put on an event, and 5,000 people are there. As people need this platform for connection. So this is a very interesting thing, the museum. And people in visual culture, musical culture, are looking toward the Contemporary Art Museum to give them a platform to make these social connections, intellectual connections, and so in one way we're very challenged, in the other we have uh, a very, very interesting opportunity. But it's, it, it's, uh, it's very challenging to be in the nonprofit sector. So I was very lucky in our gallery. Uh, didn't really have to try so hard to make money, but we just walked into a booming market. So I could do a completely crazy show with Barry McGee and spend, say, $200,000 on the show. And just whatever we wanted, we just said, okay, no problem, we'll order that. And then you sort of add up the works of berries that sell over the next year at art fairs and that sort of thing. You easily cover the 200000 You don't have to worry about it. But to actually put on an exhibition in a museum and raise the money, you know, it's... It's unbelievably difficult. And um, the museums have to compete now with the galleries that can finance projects of equal ambition without even giving a thought, particularly if you're working with an established artist where a single work sells for a couple million dollars. And the dealer's commission completely it pays for the show twice over. Uh, so we're, we're, we're in a... A position now where the museum is really needed. It's more important than ever in our culture, but uh, we've got a lot of challenges. Well, thanks. Do you have any final words for our audience here? Well, I think it's, first, it's just it's a thrill to see this exhibition, a thrill to see how Barry used the space. <laughs> and this installation gives you a good idea of how Barry works. So, it's not just hanging pictures on the wall. It's conceiving this as a whole unit, inside and outside, from the snitch that's uh, crudely <laughs> sprayed on the outside uh, to the uh, unexpected sort of uh, semi-vandalism of the front doors to this remarkable structure here. Uh, so 
and shows that Barry is, is somebody who thinks of the whole environment rather than just putting something up. And the, it's something that characterizes the best artists who come out from working out on the street because they're looking at the context, at the environment. They're not looking for that, they're not working in the studio and then putting the work in a perfect place. So they're very used to how the work functions, finding the best wall that many drivers can see from the highway so it has high impact. So it's very interesting to see how that background working on the street can really step up an artist's ability to use a space, and you can see it here. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, I just want to make a few uh, announcements. On October 19th, we will have Jim Prigoff, who's sitting right here, speaking about the history of graffiti through photography right here at the museum. Uh, tonight, of course, we're open late, and uh, I encourage all of you to visit our this show, of course, and the other galleries that are all open, and to stay for Justin Hoover and Chris Trajari, and then Devendra Banhart, who will play as well. Thank you so much to all of you who have come to uh, talk to us, perform for us uh, this evening, and I want to give uh, special thanks to Jeffrey for coming up from L.A., for supporting Barry throughout his career, and for your great words tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Larry.